Hi, this is a companion video to a video on my main channel called How to Teach Yourself Physics. You can watch that video for context, but I'm just going to be solving six problems from this book, Physics for Scientists and Engineers with Modern Physics, 7th edition. It's Surway and Jewett. Great. A bridge of length 50 meters and mass 8 times 10 to the 4 kilograms is supported on a smooth pier at each end as shown in figure. A truck of mass 3 times 10 to the 4 kilograms is located 15 meters from one end. What are the forces on the bridge at the points of support? So you have a bridge, there are two columns holding it up. They're asking what is force A and what is force B? Let's do this problem. Okay, so first let's talk about what they give you, which is the length of the bridge and the mass of the bridge, which is 8 times 10 to the 4 kilograms. They give you the mass of the truck, which is 3 times 10 to the 4 kilograms, and the position of the truck, which we can just call delta x, which is 15 meters. Let's draw a little force diagram. So if this is your bridge, which is 50 meters long, you have the support column on each side pushing up. So that's FA and FB. Gravity is going to push the bridge. Well, gravity is going to pull the bridge down at the center of mass. So we can call this F G bridge, and it's at a distance of 25 meters. And then you also have the truck, which has mass, so gravity is pulling it down. We can call this F G truck, which is at 15 meters. Okay, let's talk about the forces in this diagram. In the X direction, we don't have any arrows going left to right, so the sum of the forces is just zero. In the Y direction, we have FA and FB pushing up, and we have the gravity of the truck and the gravity of the bridge pushing down. And because this bridge is not like jumping up and down from the mass of the truck, we know that these also sum to zero. So we have FA plus FB, and we can bring those negative gravities to the other side, and we get FGT plus FGB. And we have masses for these so we can calculate the gravitational force because gravitational force is just going to be the mass of your object times the acceleration due to gravity so we get fa plus fb is going to be equal to the sum of these masses times 9.8 meters per second squared and this gives us 10.8 times 10 to the 5 newtons. Great. Next we can look at the torque. The equation for torque is RF sine theta, but here all these sine thetas are going to go to 1. So we can sum the torque on this object, and again, since it's not rotating, it should be equal to 0. So we get the torque at point A, which is 0 meters from the start of the bridge times the force Fa plus the force of gravity due to the truck, which is going to give us 15 meters from the initial point times negative FGT because that's pointing down in the negative direction, plus the mass of the bridge, which will give us negative FGB at 25 meters, plus at 50 meters, column support, the force at B. And all of that is equal to zero. This is zero, and we can kind of just start plugging things in. So this is equal to zero, so we can bring our negatives to the other side. We get 4.4 .4 times 10 to the sixth. I'm gonna put Newton meters here, our units in a little box so they don't get confused, plus 19.6 times 10 to the sixth newton meters and that will equal 50 meters times force b and we can solve for force b and we get 4.8 times 10 to the 5 newtons that's one of the things we're looking for in this problem and if we go back we have this little equation where fa plus fb equals that so we can solve for fa
and that gives us Fa equals 6 times 10 to the 5 newtons. And we have our answer. These are the forces that support the bridge. Perfect. Okay, so that was our mechanics problem. We're going to move on to mechanical waves and oscillations. Let me read you the problem. A block of mass M is connected to two springs of force constants K1 and K2 in two ways, as shown in the figure. In both cases, the blocks move on a frictionless table after it is displaced from equilibrium and released. Show that in the two cases, the block exhibits simple harmonic motion with periods. So for case one, the period is 2 pi times the root of M times K1 plus K2 over K1 times K2. And in case B, the period is 2 pi times the root of M over k1 plus k2. Okay, so let's start with case A. Let me just re-draw the picture for us. So we have one spring at k1 connected to another spring with a spring constant k2 attached to a block of mass m, and we're not worried about friction or anything. So the springs that we have here might behave differently based on how stiff they are. So pulling them both at the same time, it doesn't tell you much about what the, each spring is. We have to calculate it. Uh, so what we can think of is like, okay, imagine if this was just one spring with some K that's equivalent to however we have to add up K1 and K2. What would the force on that be? So that's the force equivalent is equal to minus the spring equivalent constant times whatever k1 causes the thing to stretch plus whatever distance k2 causes the thing to stretch. And here k equivalent is going to be however we add up k1 and k2. So by Newton's third law, where every force applied has an equal and opposite force, we know that the equivalent force here is going to be equal to whatever the force from F1 is, which will also be equal to whatever the force from F2 is, where, you know, like the standard spring force is minus standard K times delta X. So we can use this to solve for K equivalent, right? So let's start with our equivalent uh, so let's start by setting F1, I'm just going to put a little 1 there, equal to F2. So we get minus K1, X1 is equal to minus K2, X2. And this gives us the distance caused by the second spring will be K1 over K2. Okay, let's substitute that into our equivalent force, which is minus K equivalent times X1 plus X2, where we put this in for X2. So we get minus K equivalent times X1 plus K1 over K2 times X1, which gives us minus K equivalent times k2 plus k1 over k2 times x1. Now let's do, I'm just going to label this number two, with the equivalent force equal to f1, we can take minus k equivalent times k2 plus k1 over k2 times x1 is equal to k1 minus k1 times x1. Uh, our minus signs cancel, our x1s cancel, and we get k equivalent is equal to k1 times k2 over k2 plus k1. Great. Now, of course, if you just remember that resistors add like capacitors, you wouldn't have even need to think about this because it's equivalent to 1 over k equivalent equals 1 over k1 plus 1 over k2, but you can also solve it just for fun. Now we can calculate the period, which is what the question is asking for. So the period will be 2 pi over omega, which is equal to 2 pi root m over k equivalent. So we plug this in, we get 2 pi 
root m k1 plus k2 over k1 k2 and that is what they asked for at the start amazing now let's look at case two part b let me just redraw the picture so you had a little spring attached to a block and this was k1 the little spring and they're both attached to the wall and that's k2 so just looking at this we realize that if we displace the block they're going to act in the same direction so the equivalent force here is still going to be equal to minus k equivalent times delta x but here it's going to be minus k1 x1 minus k2 x2 where x1 has to equal x2 so what you get is minus k1 plus k2 times some x so we can calculate the period which will be 2 pi over omega which will give us oh no 2 pi times m over k1 plus k2 which is exactly again if you just remember from mechanics that springs act like capacitors when in parallel or in series you could have just written this down but it's still fun to check okay so our next problem is in thermodynamics at what temperature would the average speed of helium atoms equal a the escape speed from the earth 1.2 times 10 to the 4 meters per second and b the escape speed from the moon 2.37 times 10 to the 3 meters per second the mass of the helium atom is 6.64 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Okay. So they give us the mass of the helium, which is 6.64 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And they are asking us what velocity this helium atom has to be in order to escape the Earth's gravitational pull. So we're going to look at the VRMS, which will be equal to the root of 3 Boltzmann's constant times temperature over the mass. And we are going to set that equal to, in this case, oh sorry, A, Earth. The escape velocity of the Earth, which they give us is 1.12 times 10 to the 4 meters per second. So if we remember Boltzmann's constant, 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per kelvin we can just plug all of this in and solve for the temperature so t is equal to v rms squared which here will be the escape velocity times mass over 3 times boltzmann's constant which for the earth escape velocity gives you 2 times 10 to the 4 kelvin which is crazy hot for context, the temperature on the surface of the sun is like 5 times 10 to the 4 Kelvin. So that's like super hot. Let's look at part B, the moon. So luckily the equation will be the same. Temperature is equal to V RMS, but this time we'll use the moon's escape velocity times the mass over 3 times Boltzmann's constant, which gives us 901 Kelvin, which is a much more achievable temperature. So the helium can be much less hot and still escape the moon. How exciting and fun. Okay. All right, now we're moving on to electricity and magnetism. A piece of insulated wire shaped into a figure eight as shown in the figure. The radius of the upper circle is five centimeters and the lower circle is nine centimeters. The wire has a uniform resistance per unit length of three ohms per meter. A uniform magnetic field is applied perpendicular to the plane of the two circles in the direction shown. The magnetic field is increasing at a constant rate of two teslas per second. Find the magnitude and direction of the induced current in the wire. So they give us, they give us the radius of the upper circle as five centimeters. The lower circle is nine centimeters and they give us the resistance per length which is three ohms per meter, and the change in the magnetic field with time, which is two teslas per second. Okay, so what's happening is a magnetic field is inducing an EMF voltage in the wire, and we can calculate the current of that wire. It has to be insulated wire because you can't just let wires cross like that and expect nothing to happen. So first, I think we should find the total resistance of this wire. So the total 
R is going to be equal to the resistance per length times the total length, which is going to be 3 ohms per meter times 2 pi RU plus RL, where this is 5 and this is 9 centimeters, which gives us 2.6 ohms. Next, we should find the total voltage that's induced in this guy. So our EMF is going to be equal to the change in flux over time, which is just Faraday's law. And this will equal dB dt times the area of the bigger loop minus the area of the smaller loop, which gives us dB dt pi times ru squared, no, <laughs> times rl, because it's the lower, minus ru squared, which gives us 2 teslas per second times pi times 0 0.09 meters squared minus 0 0.05 meters squared which gives us 0 0.035 volts. Now, if we want the current, we can use Ohm's law, which will say that V equals IR, or in our case, I is equal to our induced voltage over the total resistance, which gives us 0 0.035 volts over 2.6 ohms, which gives us 13 milliamps. Uh, now it's asking for the direction. So I feel like I have to come back on screen to do the right hand rule. So you see in the image that the magnetic field is going into the page. So you point your thumb in the direction of the magnetic field and you do this, which is the direction of the current, but it has to be the opposite because the electrons are moving. So in the bottom loop, it is going counterclockwise. That's not, I'm gonna write it down. Let me draw the picture. So we have our two loops. In the bottom loop, it is going counterclockwise, counterclockwise, which means in the top loop, it has to be going clockwise. And you can ask, like, why is the bottom loop the one that determines the direction when the magnetic field is going in the same direction for the upper loop? But you have to imagine that the biggest loop is the one which is, like, making the voltage. And so the smaller loop is going to take away from that. So the the main voltage has to go in the bigger area it will supersede the other one if that makes sense uh faraday's law great okay so now we are in light and optics let me read you the problem two light pulses are emitted simultaneously from a source both pulses travel to a detector but mirrors shunt one pulse along a path that carries it through 6.2 meters of ice along the way Determine the difference in the pulses times at arrival at the detector. Okay, so imagine you have one detector. No, you have one emitter. And the mirrors are doing something here. So you get an A beam and a B beam. And it has to be the same emitter because you want these guys to leave at exactly identical times so that you can measure exactly how long it takes whatever light pulse to also go through... 6.2 meters of ice and this one is going to go through 6.2 meters of air right and at some point they are going to hit a detector and we want to find the difference in the arrival of beam a and beam b okay so for a we know that time is equal to change in position over velocity so in the case of light traveling through ice, we know the velocity is going to be C over the index of refraction of ice, where N is equal to 1.3. So we get 6.2 meters over 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second over 1.3, which gives us 2.7 times 10 to the minus 8 seconds. For B, we can solve the same problem where T is equal to delta X over V and V for light traveling through air is going to be C over the index. Oh, I should label these here, ice 
and here it's air, where n air is equal to 1. So we get 6.2 meters over 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, which gives us 2.1 times 10 to the minus 8 seconds. So delta t is going to be equal to ta minus tb, which gives us 6 nanoseconds. Okay. So our final problem is from the modern physics section, and it's a lot to read. Okay, so these three guys got a Nobel Prize in 1997 for the development of methods to cool entrapped atoms with laser light. And I just think laser cooling is super fun to talk about because people think lasers heat things up, but you can also cool things down and slow them down. So one part of their work was with a beam of atoms mass 10 to the minus 25 kilograms that move at a speed on the order of one kilometer per second similar to the speed of molecules in air at room temperature. An intense laser light beam tuned to a visible atomic transition, assume 500 nanometers, is directed straight into the atomic beam, that is, the atomic beam and the light beam are traveling in opposite directions. An atom in the ground state immediately absorbs a photon. Total system momentum is conserved in the absorption process. After a lifetime on the order of 10 to the minus 8 seconds, the excited atom radiates by spontaneous emission. It has an equal probability of emitting a photon in any direction, therefore the average recoil of the atom is zero over many absorptions and emission cycles. A. Estimate the average deceleration of the atomic beam. B. What is the order of magnitude of the distance over which the atoms in the beam are brought to a halt? So, we know that the mass of the atoms is 10 to the minus 25 kilograms. We know that the initial velocity is about one kilometer per second. We know that the wavelength of the photons is 500 nanometers. And we know that the time that it takes these to stop is 10 to the minus eight seconds. So for part A, they are asking for the acceleration. And for part B, they are asking for the change in position. So. Um, laser cooling works like this, like you have a beam of atoms going this way and you have a beam of photons, so like a laser going this way, and they kind of collide here where V final is equal to zero. So essentially you can trap atoms. This is how atom trapping works. You shine lasers on them until they stop moving and that's amazing and cool and definitely Nobel Prize worthy. I love to see it. So for part A we want to know how much these atoms are decelerated. So like, what is the negative acceleration that they feel? So let's look at the conservation of momentum in this problem. So you have your atoms moving in the negative direction and they slam into photons. Oh, I have solved this problem with the things backwards. So just ignore me, I'm gonna rewrite this. Say the laser is going in the positive direction and the atoms are going in the negative direction because that's how I've set up my problem. Okay, <laughs> and they hit a beam of photons which have a momentum of h over lambda, and that's gonna equal the mass times whatever the final velocity is, but because the photons are absorbed, they are not in the final momentum equation. So we get negative m times v final minus v initial is equal to h over lambda. So delta V is equal to minus H over M lambda. Let's call this one. Now to calculate the acceleration, we know that acceleration is equal to change in velocity over change in time. So we get minus H over M lambda delta T just by taking our equation one here and plugging it in. So we can write down the numbers for this we get minus 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. This is just the value of H over 10 to the minus 25 kilograms times 500 times 10 to the minus nine meters. And I'm gonna put it down here, 10 to the minus eight seconds. So let's just do a little unit check really quick. Um, so we have joule seconds over kilograms, meters, seconds. So a joule is equal to a kilogram meter squared per second squared times seconds 
over kilograms meter seconds so so our kilograms cancel one of our meters cancels and then we end up with seconds squared i'm just going to write it down there so we get meters per second squared so this does give us an acceleration the units check out so just plugging that into a calculator you get minus one times ten to the six meters per second squared which is an incredibly huge acceleration oh i had vacuums on that there you go that's a huge acceleration okay so for part b it's asking how long like what is this distance that's required to make this thing stop so we know from kinematic equations that v final squared is equal to v naught squared plus 2a delta x so solving here for delta x, we get delta x equals minus v naught squared over 2 times a. So we get minus 1 kilometers per second squared over 2 times minus 1 times 10 to the 6 meters per second squared. So just look at this image again. You have these this slow beam of atoms going this way laser light going this way and in one meter which is an incredibly small distance the atoms completely stop so you could set up this type of experiment in like a teeny tiny lab you only need a meter to stop them amazing interesting cool okay those are the problems